Hey, Bosco. Bosco's down there. Oh, your doors are though. There's Bosco. There's Bosco, yes. Oh, yes. So, what? where's the camera? Camera's right there. I do that every time. So, what's going on? Um... So my wife works at the University of Utah Hospital. She works at the CNC clinic. Uh, the serv uh, Clinical Neurosciences Center. It's right there. And uh, I drop her off and pick her up every day because it's just time that we get to spend together. You know, that's right. That's right. Oh, my gosh. And I bring the puppies because they love it when the mama comes out. And so we're just sitting here waiting for the mama, aren't we, guys? That's right. That's right. Where's Bosco? There's Bosco. He's looking out the window there, trying to see when she's going to come. Ah, that's right. Oh, my gosh. People. People. Oh my gosh, it's people. They freak out when people come. Freak out. They love people. They are such people dogs. So what does my wife do? She uh, is an x-ray technologist. So that's the person who takes x-rays whenever you, well, need an x-ray, right? Um, she had a pretty interesting path to get there. Uh, she was going to college and so on and so forth, and she finally decided this is what she wanted to do. So she went to Salt Lake Community College, guys, and there she earned, um, you need to have an associate's degree or something or another to um, get into the x-ray program. Uh, so she went ahead and did that. And then she got in the x-ray program, and during that time, you end up earning another associates, right? So she actually earned two associates through Slick, and she already had another associates before that. So the gal has three associates. Um, then she had to do two years of clinicals, so basically where you work for free, right? You work at the hospital for free. That's clinicals. Um but then she got on with you. That's where she did her clinical. She made a good impression. So when you do internships, by the way, an internship is just basically a company test driving a future employee. So take, if you can get an internship, look for them. It's not a bad idea. Um, so she did that. But then she wanted to go on and get her bachelor's degree. So she got a bachelor's degree in radiological sciences, and then following the bachelor's degree, she got a master's degree. And she just finished that master's degree, like, last month. We're talking December, December of 2020. So she is no longer in school. This is the first time in six years that she's not been in school. But you know what? It's a good example of how it is never too late. Okay? She's my age, right? And yet, she went off and got a new career, an associate's, a bachelor's, and a master's, all in six to eight years, I guess, and has a fantastic career underway. So, that's kind of cool. So, here at the uh, Clinical Neurosciences Center, what they do, well, there's basically two clinics in here, okay? Um, one clinic deals with brains, brains, brains. So one clinic deals with brains, and then the other side, they deal with spinal cords. Um, now, technically, my wife does x-rays for both, but you know what? The brain people don't do a lot of x-rays. They do very few x-rays. The Spinal people, though, the back people, they do a ton of x-rays. So she's basically a dedicated um, x-ray technologist for, um, for spines. So she's doing full spine. She does scoliosis. She does lumbar. She does C-spine. She does T-spine. She does adenoid, all kinds of things, 
things that I don't know. It's not my my world. I don't I don't know anything about that stuff. But that's what she does all day, and it's always kind of fun because, you know, on our way home, you know, where we drive home together, and I always get to say, "So, any good stories?" And every once in now, I want to be clear: she never, ever, ever shares any personal information of her patients. A, that's illegal, and B, she's way too classy for that. But whenever a patient is particularly fun or has a good story or or fun, you know, has something going on, she'll always share that. Um, I won't tell the whole story, but I'll just give you an example. I said, so any good stories? And she goes, well, I did have a guy come in and he was, he really had a bad back and injury and all this sort of stuff. And and um, And I said, oh, my gosh, what happened to you? And he said to her, Okay, now, in my defense, I was drunk at the time. Well, now, you can just imagine where the story goes from there. It involved chickens, okay? In my defense, I was drunk at the time, and it involved chickens. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, she gets some fantastic stories, and that's a lot of fun. Oh, here's the Bosco. This is the Bosco. So the one you've been seeing mostly, that's Dozer. And that one is Bosco. Hey, Bosco. Yeah. Oh, and Bosco sees a person running. That drives him nuts. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh, a person running. Oh, that drives them crazy when somebody runs by. Bosco belongs to my son. They're only like six months old. Those two are six months old. Um, We got them four months ago. So Bosco belongs to my son. And Dozer, that's right, you're the Dozer. Dozer belongs to me and Susan, my wife. Um, My son first got Bosco, and we fell in love with him. He's so stinking cute, and so we wanted one to... Hey, you know what? You know when they say two dogs are easier than one? It's true. Oh, my holy heck. Two dogs is easier than one because they entertain each other. They keep each other company. They play together. They're just so much happier together and put less pressure on you. So, yeah, I never believed it. I always thought that that was a line that dog lovers fed people because they're dog lovers. But, no, it's really too true. Two is better than one. Isn't that right? Yeah, whatever. He he doesn't care. So she ought to be coming out real soon. Is she going to come out soon, guys? Let's see. What's up? Yeah, another five minutes. So it's kind of fun. All right. Well, you know what? Let's go ahead and get this thing started. And there we are. Let's do it. Go ahead and close you up. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Hope that was fun. I told you we're going to do an opening act every day. So kind of get folks to come on in. Hey, we got Jack and Scott and Brooke and Damien. Fantastic. Great, great, great. Folks are coming in. That's that's tremendous. Hey, uh, you know, by the way, as folks come in and so forth, I'm going to tell you just a little story. So, you know, last last stream um, <laughs> fell apart, right? Fell apart. Uh, the, the my, my system crashed and everything. Luckily, some aspects still worked so we could have a discussion and so on. Um, but what we did was we uh, we I just said, OK, I'm going to go on to this view. This view pointing at my monitor. I should be pointing to you. We are going to do this view. And I pulled out the whiteboard and we used the whiteboard and so forth. Um, and we said, all right, we're going to make it work. Now, today, um, I had issue with my with my wireless mic. Um, I had charged my mic, but it said, no, nah, I'm not charged. And I didn't want to risk it. So today we're using our uh, our our real mic right? 
um, which will be fine. Just means it's going to be a little trickier to use the whiteboard. So hopefully that do doesn't become an issue. But I wanted to share with you, um, this is, my father has a saying, and I've added to it since, but I'll just share with you my father's saying. He says, there's always a solution. There's always a solution. And, um, and I really like that. And I wanted to show you something. So you see that? That's my Batman ring. Yeah, I wear a Batman ring. I'm 55 years old, and I wear a Batman ring. Well, why? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of reasons. There's a bunch of reasons I wear a Batman ring. But one of them that I'd like to share is this. When you think about Batman's superpower, what is it? Well, okay, so he's uber smart. He's a genius. Fine. That's great. There's lots of geniuses out there. Um, and he's a great detective. Fantastic. Um, he's he's rich. Rich doesn't hurt. Thank you, Laura. I'll send you five bucks later on. Should be 55, huh? <laughs> So Batman has all these cool powers, right? I mean, he, he's smart, he's rich and all that. But what is his superpower? That's right, Laura. I believe his superpower is contingency planning. Okay, so let me make the case, okay? Um, so if you were to read any Batman comic book, this one, this is a the 10th anniversary um, paperback, trade paperback edition of The Dark Knight Returns. I have the originals, but they're in boxes downstairs. And, and I got this one because I wanted something that I could mess with and read and so forth. This is a famous, a famous story written back in the uh, 80s by Frank Miller. Um, if you read any Batman comic, um, he, uh, yeah, Frank Miller, right? Batman's modus operandi is this. He'll go into a situation and get his butt handed to him. I mean, he gets the crap beat out of him. And he always fails the first time, right? And he's able to escape the bad guy barely with his life intact by the skin of his teeth. Okay? Um... He's not really going in there to get beat up. He's going in there to get information, to get data. His true power is contingency planning. He goes in and figures out all the things that could possibly go wrong, all the attacks that the baddie could possibly bring to bear. And he works out solutions and backups and redundancies and so forth to be able to anticipate all the possible contingencies so that when he goes back in and faces the bad guy, he wins. He wins. Now, it's, it's controversial, I'll tell you, but in The Dark Knight Return, Returns, Batman beats Superman. I know it's controversial. I mean, did he really beat Superman? No, not, you know. But the point is, he did so through contingency planning, right? And yes, Damien, that's exactly what he did with Bane, right? Bane broke Batman's back and took him out of the out of the picture, and so a whole bunch of other people had to take on the mantle, the cowl, the cape and cowl for Batman for quite a while. But Bruce Wayne eventually came back, and he came back smarter, knowing how to take up Bane. Okay, the point is, Lon, is there a point to this? Damn right, there's a point. I believe in contingency planning. Our, our, my, my PowerPoint, my system crashed. That's okay. I had a whiteboard. It's a backup. My mic didn't work. That's okay. I've got this mic. It's a backup. Um, one of the, if I can share any tidbit. I'm an old man. This is what old men do. They tell you how to live your life. If I could share any old man advice, it's be prepared for contingencies, risk mitigation. Because then when something goes wrong, A, you're going to be fine, and B, you're going to be totally chill. Totally fine. Because, eh, I saw this coming. We're okay. All right. Let's get over to this. 
Um, today we're talking about the nature of wealth. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say, by the way, some of the things that I'd planned for this lecture, we actually already covered in the last one, but that's because I didn't have the PowerPoint up and running and so forth. And so I wasn't quite sure what was there and so on. So there's going to be a little repeating, but I'm going to, I'm going to kind of gloss over all that sort of stuff. Um, but that's what we get to explore today. And by the look of the chance, we have a ton of folks with us today and that's tremendous, okay? And by the way, since you guys already said, you know, brought, you know, no, wrong button, you know, talked to, we, we talked about Batman and, and some folks chimed in on that. We're gonna go ahead and start that going, right? Um, okay. And hey, if I look great for 55, that's, that's totally an awesome comment, right? Vanity. Oh, my gosh. All right. Let's go ahead and do this. And we're going to start with a question. I'm going to start with a question. Um, hey, you know what, Lon? Let's pull up your marker, my highlighter. Um, I want you to think about this, okay? What does wealth mean to you? What does wealth mean to you? beautiful freaking thing about this question is there is no wrong answer. What wealth means to you is exactly what wealth means to you. So you can't get it wrong. So we're going to go ahead and go to our, you know, question frame for a moment. And I want you to chime in and tell me what does it mean to you to be wealthy? What, what does wealth mean to you? So let's see what that does. All right, fantastic. Let's uh oh no, we'll go we'll go to this one. All right. Let's take a look at this. Great 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 answers, right? Um now, by the way, I said there's no wrong answer and there still is no wrong answer. Um but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to challenge the answer. So, um let's see where where is it? Where is it? Um uh, Mauricio said unlimited resources. And you saw there that I challenged that. I said unlimited. What's unlimited? I can't fathom anything in the universe that is unlimited. Um, and so what do we mean by unlimited resources? Now, I'm going to go ahead and, and maybe Mauricio can can chime in. Um, I'm going to I'm going to um, speculate that what you're saying, Mauricio, is, you know, free and open access to the resources I need, right? Um, because wealth truly is 
in many ways, access to the resources you need and want to do the things you need and want to do. So I like it. I like it a lot. Um, Izzy, living comfortably. Um, I'm going to, and, and, and another one made me think of this as well, um, living comfortably. There's a video that I saw um, yesterday. I actually watched it a couple of times. So there's a really good YouTube series called uh, The School of Life. And uh, um, the, the, the guy who created The School of Life, and he has a whole business and so forth around The School of Life, um, uh, Le Baton, I forget his first name, Adrian Le Baton, I forget. But he has this really incredible video. Sure, it's only like five minutes long um, that basically says, why is it no longer considered okay to live an ordinary life? And he makes the case that 99% of us are going to live perfectly ordinary lives. Perfectly ordinary lives. So why would you create a condition upon yourself that you are 99% certain to fail at and be miserable for no good reason. And now getting to the point of what Izzy says about living comfortably, um, he says, never in human history has the ordinary life been so awesome. If you live an ordinary life, you're gonna have a nice home. You're gonna have a reliable car. You're gonna be able to take a hot bath every day. You'll have a you know roof over your head and you'll have nutritious food. At easy access, and you'll have friends and access to resources and entertainment. This is an ordinary life, and no, at no time in human history has such a rich, luxurious life been considered ordinary. I love that. Okay, living comfortably, I totally agree. Scott says, a good place financially and health, health is wealth, and most important, you know, they always say, you know, if you don't have your health, you, you know, you have nothing. So true. So true. My wife works at the hospital. You just saw the whole spiel of my work, wife working with spinal patients and so forth. And, and isn't it amazing? You've all had moments where you've been unhealthy, been ill or, or um, injured. And like nothing else matters at that point, right? Oh, yeah, totally agree. Abundance of money and other valuables. Brooke, I'm going to play with that one um, because somebody else said health and money. Alma, you said health and money. You know, if we look at money, let's pause for a moment. Remember, money in and of itself is nothing. Doesn't exist. What money affords is totally wealth. Right. So going back up to what Mauricio said about, you know, access, free and open access to resources. And then, Brooke, you say abundance of money and other valuables. I really like this. One of the things that I like to pontificate upon is I say, listen, it is said that in America, you're free. You're free to do whatever, you know, within the confines of the law and social construct. And you're free. And I say, no, 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 no. You are as free as your resources allow you to be. So if we look at Brooks, abundance of money and other valuables and access to resources, as Mauricio said and so forth, Alma, health and money, um, I may be free in terms of being an American citizen to fly to Paris. I'm free to go to Paris, right? Get a passport. I'm legally qualified to go to Paris. However, I don't have the financial means to go to Paris at all. I don't have the financial means to go to Paris. Spent it all on this set. Anyway, therefore, since I do not have the financial means, the resources to go to Paris, I am no more free to go to Paris than a guy sitting in jail. I want you to really think about that. Our freedom, our ability to do things and live fulfilled lives and so forth often come down to what resources do we have available. And so that's what you guys are pointing out. Obtain the freedom I want 
to do the things I love. Oh, Damien, yes, free time and, and time to self-actualize. Be in possession of something that has value, right? Yeah, Vampirella number one, right? Okay, security. D uh, Dylan says security. Yes, yes, I really like that. Um, yes, having the necessities to live a comfortable life made me think again of Le Breton and, uh, and, and living an ordinary life, ordinary. Um, Adrian, wealth is uh, becoming the man of my word. Wealth is having integrity. Wealth is achieving your goals and dominating in every aspect of your life. Wealth is power within everything if deserved. Okay, this is interesting. They're all interesting, guys. <laughs> don't, don't think, you know, this is interesting, though. Um, wealth is often thought of in terms of what you've got things. Okay. I got that. I got that. I got, I got this. I got this. And I got a wife who has stuff. That's wealth, right? But wealth is also a lot of other things. Wealth is power. We're going to talk about that. Okay. Um, wealth is um, being able to um, have the skills to accomplish your goals, right? So um, you can be wealthy in skills. You can be wealthy in thinking processes. Somebody who really knows how to do stuff and has a lot of skills is wealthy because that allows him or her to achieve things, to accomplish things, to earn and so forth. I like it. Um, Laura says, um, having the ability to take care of myself and my family financially, um, you know, be able to share those great moments and have the knowledge to share um, how I get this for myself. Yes, I really like it. Wealth is often connected to our ability to raise a family, to raise a family well, to be able to provide for our family. So I kind of feel like and. Guys, I know I'm going on about this, but I freaking love it. I'm sorry. Um, I kind of feel like the new bling today, this isn't bling. Um, phones aren't even bling anymore. I'll tell you what new bling is for parents to be able to sign their kids up for all the soccer lessons, for all the music lessons, for all the sports and for all the activities and to be able to complain about, oh, I have to go take my son to this person or my daughter is going off to Vegas to do this competition or my son is in football, my daughter is in cheer and drill and, and they're in piano lessons. And the more we can provide for our families and really give them these things, that's today's suburban bling. I know because I've been there, all right? But that's wealth. That's wealth. Oil money. <laughs> yeah, right. I love it. Um, very good, Mauricio. Oh, Andrea says having money to be financially stable, provide for yourself and your family. Yes, very much live comfortably. Um, and then Laura chimed in with Adrian. Uh, wealth is power with everything of deserved. So true. We're going to explore that. Owning something value such as money, gold, or having a great condition to live. Very nice. Um, Andre, um, good. Adrian chimes in with Laura. Fantastic. Um, oh, Adam adds, getting good at the things I enjoy, like photography and guitar. Yeah. Getting good at the things you enjoy. Thank you, Adam. That's what I mean by skills. And by the way, I just hooked up an electric guitar. I have never touched a guitar in my life, but I'm taking a class on audio. So I just hooked up a guitar to my sound system here and I'm going to use it in an audio, some audio um, uh, homework. So I'm kind of excited about that. Um, when your son or daughter call you and they are ranked highest in their bank, <laughs> glorious moment. I love it. I love it. 
Guys, fan freaking tastic. So, um, um, so here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna take this all the way. Um, ten easy. I mean, you guys killed it. I know for a fact that we got ten contributors. We had a few references to other comments in there, so I'm gonna take that up to four. And we had at least a couple of real world examples. So, guys, seriously, fantastic. We've just begun and you're totally there. I really like it. So, you know the deal. Go ahead and send me a timestamp. Um, what time is it? Um, it's 1022. Just do 1022, right? Um, after the, the lecture, go ahead and send me an email saying 1022. And um, we're going to go ahead and recognize you for your awesome engagement. OK. Um, yeah. Yeah. At all, I'll tell you stories about guitar later on. That's all right. OK. Guys. Oh, hey, thank you, Damien. I appreciate that. That's cool. Um, you want to know why I love teaching? I, I love I love teaching for a bunch of ideas, for a bunch of reasons. One is I get to play with these incredible ideas and just have fun with them and be able to play with them with others and to explore them. I could go on forever. Don't worry, I won't. Okay, so let's look at this. Now, I want to be clear. All your definitions, perfect, great, fantastic. What wealth means to you is what wealth means to you. Um, we all have that right in our lives to decide what drives us, right? Um, now, we're going to explore some other ideas of wealth. This is not to say this is the right answer. I'm just saying here are some other ideas. Now, this is from one of the readings that you've had access to. This is kind of the Greek attitude toward wealth. Let's look at this. The ancients appreciated wealth as much as any modern society. Examine the history of Greece, and it's easy to get a feel for their fascination with wealth. However, it is not private wealth. The Greeks were more interested in public wealth than private wealth. Okay, so let's look at what we mean by public wealth versus private wealth. All right. Libraries. Now, by the way, real quick. <laughs> Don't think for a moment that today's libraries are dusty old places where books are kept and so forth. Um, do yourself a favor. Get yourself a county library card. And that library, and then go online to the county library system, right? Um, SLCOlibraries.org, something like that, or gov. And the online resources you have access to through your library for free are incredible. I mean incredible. We're talking languages, music lessons and resources, uh, technical skills, computer skills, all kinds. It is amazing how much normally paid services are available through the library, okay? Um, Lynda.com, all kinds of things. So libraries are what the Greeks would say, this is public wealth. We are wealthy because look at our libraries, right? Museums, national parks, right? This is something that that demonstrates our wealth as, as a people. K through 12 education with a focus on gen ed. Okay, so let's break this one down. K through 12 education paid through through the state. All right. Yes, there are plenty of fees that parents have to pay for K through 12. But for the most part, this is an edu this is public education paid for by the state. Um, but what's interesting is this focus on Gen Ed. Um, here in the United States, in the Western world in many cases, and that's because our Western world is kind of built on Greek philosophy. 
to some extent. Um, we put a lot of emphasis on the Renaissance person to have a little bit of knowledge about a lot of things. It's interesting how we as a people, and again, this is rooted in, in Greek philosophy, we as a people, as a society, have decided that the, the, the measure of a wealthy person intellectually is that they can hold an intelligent conversation about any topic in the world for 10 minutes. If you're at a cocktail party, right? So I'm not an expert in engineering, but I can have a conversation about engineering for 10 minutes and sound fairly intelligent. I'm not an expert in truck driving. I'm not an expert in guitars. But right now, Adam, I could have an intelligent conversation about guitars for 10 minutes because I'm taking a gen ed class on audio, right? So this is something that our society has deemed as the sign of wealth, that you can actually talk about these things and have insight into them. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying that's what our society is focused on. Festivals and fairs, parades, celebrations, government regulatory departments around public health and safety, national archives, power, water, transportation, infrastructure. Okay, let's take power, water, transportation, infrastructure for a moment, right? Um, later on in this lecture series, and the, the, the name of the lecture series is, is, American, is America Capitalist or Socialist. It's totally clickbait, right? Um, <laughs> truth is, we're somewhere in the middle. And we're going to talk about that in depth. Um, but the very fact that we have decided, wrong button, Lon, the very fact that we've decided as a people, as a community, as a nation, that everybody should have highly affordable access to power, water, transportation, and other infrastructures is a sign of a wealthy nation, right? These are all things that only a wealthy nation can provide its people either free of charge or so cheap it's for all intents and purposes free of charge. So here's what I want us to just kind of embrace for a moment. You and I live a life that throughout the vast majority of human history is luxurious. We live a really nice... now. I want to be clear, and I want to be empathetic, and I want to. I want to state outright. I do not know your situation. I do not know your financial situation. I do not know your family situation. I do not know your your housing or your food situation. And it would be very, very, very heinously presumptuous of me to just assume that everybody has equal access to all of these important resources. Um, that said, I always remember something that somebody in India told me one time. He said, I want to be poor in America where even the poor people have, are fat and have cell phones. Now, I don't want to body shame or anything like that. I mean, come on, I've got my fair share of insulation, right? But the point he was making is that in India, when people are poor, they starve to death. And whereas here, that's not necessarily the case. We have access to all kinds of wealth because we are a wealthy nation, at least here in the United States. I don't know where others are watching. Again, I want to be cognizant of that. But look at everything we have. This is pretty much the only time in human history where ordinary people like you and me, me, I'm ordinary, I'm ordinary, where ordinary people like me get to live a pretty sweet life. That is what the reading suggests is, is wealth, okay? Um, but you guys are smart. You also pointed out wealth is 
power and influence. I cannot overstate how much I agree with you. Um, really, money, remember, doesn't really exist. We'll, we'll come back to that here in a moment. But it's really what money affords us, which is wealth. So money allows me to buy this cool thing, right? I have money, ergo I can buy it. It affords me the opportunity to buy these, these, these technologies. Uh, money affords me the opportunity to take a vacation, to travel. Um, money affords me health because I can pay for health insurance and so forth. But money can also afford me influence, right? We're going to talk about that in depth in this lecture series. It's not just that you're paying for influence. That's not just what money is about. If somebody is wealthy, they are perceived as hardworking, successful, and so on and so forth, and that gives them influence. Again, we're going to play with this a great deal later on, but when we talk about the haves and have-nots, Sometimes it is, yeah, who has food, who has a house. But what it really comes down is who has the power and influence. Laura, living in the U.S. my whole life, I never thought that being fat and having a cell phone is wealth. But I like that perspective. My father, who is Greek, will never, <laughs> uh, never let a lemon go to waste. Yeah, you know, it's it's. By the way, we're going to talk about profit motive later in this series. Mauricio brought up profit motive um, on Monday. We're going to talk in depth about it. And profit motive is actually one of the things that causes us to underappreciate the wealth that we have because we always want more. We always want more. I like to every once in a while sit back and go, I have it pretty good because it's awfully easy to fall prey to our first world problems and go, oh, that ice cream just wasn't as delicious as I thought it would be. This day isn't turning out well. OK, um, let's see. Money, value. Absolutely. Uh, Adrian, the more value you provide, more money is provided. Um, you know what? Okay, it's interesting. Um, Adrian, I believe that when it comes to economics, you are paid not by the value that you provide society, but by the value that you provide the economy. Let me make my case, okay? Um, let's say a grade school teacher, all right? A grade school teacher and a pro football player. A grade school teacher provides more value to society. Um, however, a pro football player provides a lot more value to the economy. A grade school teacher doesn't provide hardly any value to the economy. But a football player, tons of value to the economy. So I'll make that case later on in a different lecture, but you, you guys are just totally with it. Um, so conspicuous consumption is not just for the ultra wealthy. Um, Mauricio, A, we're going to talk in depth about conspicuous consumption. And B, you're totally right. You're totally right. Yeah. Completely agree. Okay. Um, so that's really, oh, wrong button. At least the buttons are working today. Remember, we talked about this before. I'm not going to go into it. I wanted to just reiterate that, you know, money, the dollar bill is not um, uh, is not in and of itself wealth. It's what the dollar provides. It's what the dollar makes available. A dollar provides food and shelter. It provides education. It provides influence. It provides free time. It provides all kinds of things. By the way, you all remember from, from our previous lecture that I made the case that money is kind of doesn't, it's not real, doesn't exist. It's just an idea. It's just an idea. 
Um, I wanted to tell you a story, kind of make this case. Um, you guys, have any of you ever written a check? Is that done anymore? I don't know. I don't, I don't remember the last time I wrote a check. Actually, I do. I wrote a check the other day because we had our, our chimney rebuilt. And the guy who rebuilt it, who did an amazing job, he was like 117 years old. And he like still did checks. And I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> um. I've written many. I would know we've written, but do we any more? Okay, so here's a story. This is a story to kind of show you how the idea of money is 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 an abstraction, right? So, um, I'm working on my bachelor's degree. I'm newly wed. I have a baby kid and all this. So I am. I'm in my. I'm like 23 or 24, right? So this is over 30 years ago and back then everything's checks and 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 we run out of checks my wife and i run out of checks and uh now in order to get checks you have to buy them you have to buy checks from your bank and i thought well that's jacked up i'm broke i'm seriously broke why am i paying the bank to get checks to allow me access to my money so I can give money to other people. Well, as it turns out, and you can't quite see it down here, but this is a website to Cornell's law site, right? www.law.cornell.edu and blah, blah, blah. You can find it. Um, you can write a check on anything, right? So without getting weird, you can just take a check. You can take a piece of paper, blank piece of paper. And so long as you write your name, your bank account number, your bank account number, your account number, and the amount, and you sign it, paid to the order of, and sign it, it's a legal and valid check. It, there's nothing, nothing on here that is official. Right? It's it's just a piece of paper, just like a dollar bill. It it's so you can print your or just write your own check. So I had a computer and a printer. I know, right? Thirty years ago I had a computer and a printer. I you know, I've been doing this a while. So I wrote I designed my own checks and printed them and wrote them and signed them. They looked like any other check. It was really interesting. I sent them off to all my bills and I got two kinds of responses. All my responses came in two different categories. One response was, thank you very much. We'll cash your check. We're fine. And they would cash the check. My bank accepted it because it's legal. The other group said, we cannot accept this. This is not a check. You're in trouble. And I would, because I'm 23, 24 years old, I, I, you think you can win arguments. I would go in and explain to them that this is totally legal. This is right. This is, I can do this and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter. I could show all kinds of legal precedent. I could show all kinds of documentation from my bank saying that this is appropriate. I can do this. They say, no, we won't accept it. That is an example of how faith and faith alone in the system is what gives money its power, its value. Just because the checks I printed were completely 100% legal tender did not change the fact that some of the people I sent them to did not have faith in that check and would not accept it. So, yeah, as soon as people stop having faith, this is a dude going off to buy a loaf of bread and he's using a wheelbarrow full of money because money has lost its value. And I mentioned before, Venezuela, here's a report you can look up if you want, talking about how Venezuela's currency lost all its value. Just amazing. So money isn't wealth, it's what money affords. Okay, here's some quotes.
but we already talked about this last time. I'm not going to bore you with it again. Um, ultimately, money, an abstraction of value, a mostly universally accepted symbol of the idea of value. Okay, that's it. Short one today, because like I said, we did the money one last time when I didn't really mean to. Um, Mauricio says, today is an example too. GameStop, AMC Movies, and other stocks skyrocket. All the companies have been um, failing for years, are not worth nothing. This is exactly right. Okay, this is exactly right. Is a stock, and this is not only a um, reference to Paddock's example because Damien uh, signed, uh, chimed in there, but a real world example, right? Um, stocks are the same thing. If you think they're worth something, they're worth something. If you think they're not worth something, they're not worth something. Nobody can tell you this stock is worth something. It's up to the individual investor. It's a free market. So, nuts. It's fascinating. I just love the idea that this thing that we put so much value in is really just as valuable or valueless as we make it out to be. But, you know, again, that's why I love my job, folks, and I appreciate you letting me do my job. I love playing with these ideas. Just adore it. So there you are, everyone. And don't forget to send me the email because you guys did an absolutely fantastic job today. Um, really, really great. Um, and and there we are. Um, same thing with all the other assignments. It's pretty standard now. Um, I've given you some of feedback. By the way, if you don't get a ton of feedback, that's because you're doing great. It's when somebody's struggling or not quite delivering what I think they're capable of delivering that I kind of give a little bit of feedback. Um, but don't think that I'm not looking and not caring. I really enjoy this, and I enjoy what I see you guys putting out there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Damien. I appreciate it. Um, and Adrian, I'm going to stick around if you have any questions. And uh, otherwise, have a great day. And yeah, Scott, have a great weekend. It's weird to say have a great weekend and still on Wednesday morning, but I won't see you again until Monday, so I get it. All right. Okay, everyone, um, take it easy. Have a good one. And we'll see you on Monday.